Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining with, joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library hosting it today on this GoToWebinar platform. If you are having any technical issues, as in you can't hear us or you can't see the screen, I recommend logging off and logging back on. If you have a more persistent issue, please uh, use the chat panel and I will try and help you. Uh, we will be recording today's presentation and all questions will be held until the end. Um, and we, we do recognize that this is a rescheduled one. So if you have a colleague or someone who wasn't able to attend today because of the reschedule, um, please know that the recording will be up on the library's YouTube channel and um, able to share within about 24 hours of this presentation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany House to introduce our speaker. To err is human to forgive divine just in case you thought we were robots the recent issue with last week shows that we are real and we are human i'm glad that you all joined us today and gave mr flag another chance i'm sure you will appreciate the information that he will share with you today my name is tiffany house and i am the NOAA sbir commercialization specialist the SBAR program is a highly competitive program that encourages domestic small businesses to engage with the federal government in developing products or services that have potential for commercialization while meeting agency mission needs. Desert Star Systems received phase two awards in FY 2008, 2009, and 2019 from the NOAA SBIR program. But today, Marco will discuss his FY 2019 project. As you can see, you can receive more than one award. However, it cannot be for the same work. I will also like to note that the technology that will be highlighted today is available for phase three under the SBIR rules, which means it can be acquired as a sole source procurement for NOAA or other federal agencies. The Ocean Dashboard is Desert Star's vision for comprehensive near real-time ocean monitoring using small, long-endurance autonomous satellite recording sensors that can be developed in large numbers to significantly improve sampling density. Marco Flagg founded Desert Star Systems in 1992. Marco combines out-of-the-box engineering thought with a passion for ocean exploration that has led him to journeys of the deep ocean in the jaws of a great white shark, at each step gaining new understanding of the particular environment and the needs of researchers, and translating that knowledge into new products and concepts. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Marco Flagg. Well, thank you uh, very much for the introduction, Tiffany, and everybody in the audience. Um, my apologies that I missed the time slot uh, last week, uh, but I was a bit distracted. And that distraction that happened is also related to um, dashboards, in this case, not an ocean dashboard. But uh, I built that into this talk here, and uh, you will you might see the relevance of um, this concept here a bit better. So the focus of this talk today is on you. So it's not meant to be like a TED talk with just a general uh, concept to contemplate, but rather it's something where I want you to look at it and say, hey, are there some tools here that will help in my work, can I do something to improve uh, the management and protection of resources or whichever other aspects you are involved with? So it's very nuts and bolts. And there is three parts to the talk. First, I'm going to explain the Ocean Dashboard concept so you can see if this really applies to you, is this relevant to you? And then I will give you some use examples to just kind of jog your mind and say, hey, you know, something like this. And, and, you know, these are by far not the only things you can do with it. It might give you some other ideas and you understand what's possible now and really how we have validated what we're doing. And then finally, if you're looking at starting sort of an ocean dashboard project, 
yourself, then what are the options available to you to go about that? So first, we will start with a introduction of the, the ocean dashboard concept. And so the problem statement is this, on land, the management of our resources has really changed dramatically over the last um, uh, number of years in particular. When I'm driving to, to work here in Monterey County, I see drones over the fields. There are sensors in the fields. And really, um, how we are getting um, uh, best efficiency, say, in, in agriculture, um, how we are running our transportation system, forestry, wildlife protection is increasingly sensor-based. Sometimes it's called the Internet of Things. And here I found a graph that shows sort of the explosive growth of uh, uh, installed Internet devices. And when you look, the portion of that, you know, personal computer stuff was pretty much everything in the early years. And now the Internet of Things is exploding in size even more so than, than smartphones, for example. All right, I'm not now going to go back to uh, what was distracting me uh, uh, last week. Um, our company is located in Marina, California. That's right here. And where I live is right here in the mountains in Carmel Valley. And last Monday, uh, last weekend, we had dry lightning in the area overnight. It was really quite something. Um, my whole house illuminated in blue, but very little thunder, quite spooky. And the next morning, a number of fires had started here along my commute route. And so that night, um, uh, uh, as I was driving home in the summer, I, I ride my motorbike home. There was just smoke in my eyes. But the fire, as you can see, was still a long distance away. Then came the day of the presentation. And right uh, after noon, I got a call uh, from a friend saying, hey, another fire started. And uh, this is my house here. A few hours later, I could only reach this vantage point here, some three miles away. My house is here, and this is what it was the next morning. It was gone. And so the question is, is our response fast enough? Are we protecting our resources well enough? Yes, there's satellite heat maps. Um, that's what uh, you know I had uh, uh, looked at here, but satellites you have to wait for the next pass, it takes too long. What about if there had been an infrared sensor right here in different places? And the fire department, which was only a, a half a mile away uh, from uh, our, our neighborhood, uh, could have probably prevented this. Now, let's look what we are dealing with at sea. Uh, rather than on land. Even though on land we have many uh, sensors, even they may still be inadequate. Uh, the situation at sea is quite different. There, yeah, the sensors remain expensive and sparse, and therefore uncertainty reigns. And we see that all the time. Again, right here in our local neighborhood, Big Sur is used by drug runners to just run these uh, skiffs up on beach with a load of drugs. And they can usually get away with it because nobody really knows what's going on. It might surprise you. Don't we have radar? Yes, we do. It doesn't reach very far. Don't we have satellites? Yes, we do. But uh, they don't give you the real-time response that you need. And so we have that here in Big Sur. But when you look around the world, you know that uh, piracy has proliferated. And these low speedboats running around on the ocean going after cargo ships can pretty much go undetected in many cases. Um, let's take another example here. Our company is involved with ropeless fishing. That's uh, pop-up buoys, as you can see here, for, for lobster and crab fishers. Uh, the risk to whales is when you have a standard static buoy at the surface, and then a rope to the seafloor, whales get entangled in it. And so this pop-up buoy concept allows you to command the buoys to the surface when you need it and when you're watching it. 
It's very controversial. And one question is in the biggest fishery that we have in, in Maine for lobster fishery uh, here in the United States, um, uh, you know, uh, do they really impact the whales? And the fishers are always saying, no, there are no right whales in Maine. And the scientists, including uh, those of you at NOAA, are saying, well, we think there are right whales in Maine because how would they get from the Carolinas to the Gulf of St. Lawrence? But there's not really very much data. There's just a little bit of data available. And so this uncertainty of the migratory route of the whales in turn means um, that, that uh, there's a lot of political uncertainty as to what to do next. Uh, with the regulations here. Um, uh, in, in fisheries around the world, um, factory ships, uh, large fishing trawlers, raid fishing grounds, switching off the uh, auto uh, autonomous identification system, the AIS. And so here you can see a, a track of one vessel going to the Galapagos Island. Then it disappears for 15 days and all of a sudden, as it leaves this area, it shows up again. So again, no good sensory capability translating to uncertainty. Was there now a lot of illegal take in the Galapagos Island? And moving on to other areas, uh, just understanding our resources. Here I found a headline in The Economist, the mysterious life and times of eels, or that they would that it would rise to the level of showing up in the uh, economist. And no one really knows exactly how eels reproduce. And the same is, uh, is the case with other fish that are of commercial importance, like sable fish, which is the uh, focus of our current research. And that, of course, uh, does matter to the future of these species. So Ocean Dashboard is Desert Star's guiding vision to solve sensing problems using many communicating smart sensors you know and these are meant to be small sense uh, um, uh, low cost devices five hundred dollars to two thousand uh, dollars it's sort of in the price range of what a smartphone might be and also easy to deploy so you can just drop them from airplanes because they're very small operational flexibility they might drift with the current they might dive they might sit on the seafloor and monitor then pop up to report and of course animal tagging and with long endurance going for over a year or so. Uh, finally, reusable, the idea is um, not implemented, but one might imagine that when somebody finds a sensor like this on, on the beach, they would scan it, pop it in the mail, they would maybe get a $100 reward. And what you get is you get to recover the archive data, which is far more extensive than anything it can transmit via satellite. So the Ocean Dashboard is not a monolithic project. It's not like, hey, we are developing the Ocean Dashboard. It's a guiding concept. And it really started back in, in 2010, 2012, with the SeaTac uh, SBIR from NOAA that we had for, for, for uh, pop-up satellite tags. And we said, no, we don't want to build just uh, one tag as the solicitation called for, but make a modular line of tags so it could be used for many things. And now it turns out these things extend far beyond animal tagging. Um, we have since demonstrated the endurance of these uh, in, with our customers, through our customer project, since 2012 and uh, our company also has a lot of experience with uh, underwater acoustic systems and so now we are adding acoustic detection and there's a lot you can tell about the ocean by listening to it next step might be your project somewhere in here maybe you're coming up with something and due to the modular uh, architecture that we have that could then be added uh, we are also adding a uh, robust and fast acoustic data exchange capability that's actually under a DARPA SBIR that's starting right now. And then next year, we hope to add uh, sensor dive capability so they can listen not just from the surface, but also from underwater where the acoustics are much better and then rise to the surface to report. Now, it has an ocean dashboard type concept. Um, is that just Desert Star's idea? No, not at all. Uh, when, when we first um, sort of condensed uh, this idea uh, based on uh, part, 
participation back then in a in a, um, a navy seminar where they looked what the the navy needs um you know sort of in the five to ten year time frame out and they said well our problem is we have very sophisticated sensors for the navy that's there ships and airplanes and drones that carry all these sensor packages but they have very very few of them and that's what led us to to sort of crystallize the idea of the ocean dashboard but at the same time um digi the digital ocean concept was developed by liquid robotics uh, also announced right around the same time actually and uh, then in 2080 uh, darpa came up with the ocean of things and all these concepts do similar things and uh, but take slightly different approaches for it the the primary platform for us are just these small ocean drifters and divers while digit uh, while uh, liquid robotics which is now a boeing company emphasizes wave gliders which have the advantage that you can steer them they go where you want to go you know um darpa is sticking strictly with ocean drifters at that point their target price per platform is actually very similar to ours, um, while a wave glider, of course, is far more expensive than that. Looking next at mission endurance, actually, um, uh, Digital Ocean, they are, um, sorry, Liquid Robotics, they can run their gliders for half a year, maybe up to one year before they lose too much performance due to uh, various fouling mechanisms. And we have, we see an average um, um, time reporting endurance once a tag pops up to the uh, surface of about five months and three years have also been observed. Um, uh, DARPA is, is, is somewhat less. They went for a heavier platform, six to 10 kilograms. And in combination with low cost, that seems to have translated to uh, a fairly short endurance that they're admitting to. 24 days observed with a target of one year here again you have the the weight and um, since our sensors are very small i believe you will be able to drop them from airplanes uh, just drop them into the water they're like low arrows i still have to test that out that that's really the case i've done some calculations and i think we'll be fine but again i need to validate that uh, it takes a boat on site to deploy um, uh, a glider, so glider will not have as many sample points from that perspective alone, and then one man deployment from boats for the heavier um, uh, DARPA sensors. Maneuverability, drift and dive, drift only, and then of course the best maneuverability are the wave gliders. Um, let's take a look at the architecture of uh, these, you know, some people call them sort of or have called them in a different magazine here, uh, our tag, the smartphone of the oceans. And what's very important here, you see an actual picture of it, it's wrapped, wrap around solar panel that gives it long endurance, but the sun doesn't shine all the time, not at night, not when an animal is at depth. And so we have an energy pack here, a capacitor pack in here. And this tag in, in its sort of standard operating mode can operate for about two weeks without sunlight and then it can recharge in a matter of 30 minutes. Then you have an electronics board with various sensors on it, a satellite transmitter, this purple thing here. And finally and importantly, this plug-in connector for a payload section puts something new, maybe something that's specific to you on it. Let's take a look at some use examples. Uh, the first one here is accidental. Um, uh, uh, one of our SeaTac mod devices was placed by Neil Hammerschlag, uh, a uh, researcher at the University of Miami, on a tiger shark in 2012 uh, to monitor the tiger shark. And in the first year, the, the, the shark, uh, and that's not shown here, went up from the Bahamas all the way to offshore Nova Scotia. So if you do a family vacation there in Nova Scotia, you'll know that there's uh, sharks there too although actually they stay down here in the warmer Gulf, war, um, Gulf Stream waters. Then it came back down, very good site fidelity. The tag popped up and started to drift. That's now December 2012, again, following the Gulf Stream. 
And uh, finally, 10 months later, it was up here and the solar panel had fouled enough to where it couldn't talk to the satellite anymore, but not so much that it couldn't uh, keep acquiring data. And it kept doing that, drifted across the Atlantic here. And as it approached Ireland, something strange happened. Uh, we, we saw suddenly the tag was sinking. I thought this was a bad sensor or something like that. Here it went to 450 meters. Then it suddenly went to the surface again. It stayed at the surface for a week or so, suddenly sinking again to 200 meters, again consistent with water depth. And then it happened a third time. And it took me a while to figure out what's going on. Why would a tag like this suddenly sink? Could it somehow lose buoyancy? Did some animal attach to it? No, I think it was a, hydro, a hydrocarbon sink. And I looked it up in this area where this happened is Ireland's porcupine basin. And there are these methane or hydrocarbon sinks. They, you can see methane from the uh, surface uh, from a satellite, but only at the surface. You cannot tell if it, it's biological at the surface or if it's from the deep ocean. And so the tag getting caught up in this stream mix of bubbles and uh, water uh, was essentially in a lower density medium. And so it sank to the seafloor. Similar thing to what the Falco, a research ship, was doing here uh, in the Pacific coast. But as you can see, it's much cheaper to use a tag like this than a research ship. Uh, here you see the, the very tag uh, as it was tagged in uh, December. Uh, 2012, this is, um, no, December 2011, that's correct, when it was tagged on the shark. And then three years later, it looks like this, you see a lot of bite marks, the antenna is a bit bent, but it still worked, you know, it was folded up, uh, we had to um, clean it here a bit to see the label. Um, survival statistics, 12 months on a shark, 24 months drifting across the Atlantic, and then another 10 months, or oh, uh, during that 24 months drift, I should say, 10 months of reporting and thereafter only data acquisition. Um, now we're going on to the, the second example, monitoring species in a marine protected uh, area. And here you can see somebody with a spear gun and notice a low tag at the tip of it aimed at a shark tagging sharks. So. Um, uh, this group of people uh, around Patrick Douglas, who I interfaced with a loss, and, and Darcy Bradley, um, were really studying reef sharks in the uh, Bikini Atoll. This is where the nuclear tests were done after World War II, uh, during the Cold War. And they wanted to know how did sharks get to these waters again, because they thought the the sharks, uh, the reef sharks always stayed local around whatever island they're on. They found out that's not the case. So the Bikini Atoll really got populated by sharks coming in from different islands. But then what they also saw is this trajectory of the tags, so many of them just going um, to the west. And uh, one of them uh, ended up in the last transmission was from uh, a harbor in Guam, another one uh, from a harbor in the Philippines. And so the authors are suggesting that this is sign of illegal fishing activity, essentially that fishermen caught those sharks and for whatever reason, maybe didn't know the tag is still transmitting cause it's just solar powered and gave away what was happening. This was sort of an accidental thing, but it shows that if you now imagine putting, you know, uh, tags on high value turtles, for example, critically endangered turtles, you could get a map as to where they are. And if something is going on, turtles suddenly disappearing, that might clue you in that uh, there's illegal fishing activity or some other sort of hazard uh, for these animals. Now let's, um, uh, look at another example here, and this is actually um, the primary focus of the SBIR work for NOAA right now, and this uh, relates to uh, a sable fish. Um, and uh, the question is, what is really 
Uh, sable fish is commercially important. A lot of it is uh, exported to the Far East. And the question is really, are we dealing with one population there? Are we dealing with multiple populations there? And in order to determine that, um, you know, what you want to do is when you catch the fish, you get a DNA sample and then you see some variations there. But does that mean there are uh, different populations that need to be uh, protected separately or is it still a mixed population? So if you then relate the DNA to the spawning uh, uh, location, then you might be able to discern individual populations. And so what you do is you put a tiny, tiny pinger in the ovary of the fish. And as the fish is spawning, the pingers ejected with the spawn. That method has been validated by other scientists. An external tag here with a special payload section senses that it doesn't get the pinger signal anymore. It says, hey, the pinger signal is gone. This must be spawning. It measures, okay, what was the depth, the water temperature, some other parameters, pops up to the surface to report, and now you will know where the spawning event occurred. And this part of our SPIR is almost completed now. Here you see a payload section for the SeaTac mod here. This was an earlier prototype. It looks a little bit nicer now. And here you see the tiny pinger, this guy here being injected in the ovary of a fish. It's uh, tracked with uh, some uh, ultrasonic imaging. And here you see the tank in the fish and the tag. In this case, early test, it was just floating at the surface, detecting the signal from inside the fish. And we haven't done it yet, but you know the, this little thing also transmits uh, temperature so you can get fish internal temperature. Example number four, offshore acoustic detection, tracking and reporting of cetaceans whales and dolphins. That goes back again to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, how do the right whales uh, get to the Gulf of St. Lawrence? And already some time ago, based on work with NOAA as well as Office of Naval Research, we developed these uh, underwater acoustic recorders. And in the latest version of them that we call Sonar Point, they can also now localize sounds when you have a number of the recorders deployed here. And we are seeing that here, here you see these little red dots are locations of recorders that we actually kind of, uh, they were drifting on the ocean, looked like this. And we were just following um, a part of killer whales in the San Juan Islands and uh, just kind of putting uh, these buoys in the water and as sounds, vocalizations of the killer whales are uh, received by several of the recorders you can get a track as to where they are going. So you can do all that, but it's all based on post recovery analysis. So it's not real time actionable intelligence. And so the second part of the current SBIR, we're going a bit further and um, uh, we will now implement an acoustic broadband recording capability in a tiny lipstick sized uh, payload section, you can see that here. And then when uh, an animal such as a killer whale makes a vocalization, we are not trying to have this thing say, oh, this was a killer whale. Um, that would be a very, very difficult task and would be very hard to validate if that was really a killer whale or a right whale or whatever. But rather what this device will do is fingerprint this sound sample. It will say, okay, you know, here's a, um, a starting frequency, ending frequency, and so on. Build a small packet that can be easily transmitted even through the slow Argos satellite data link to shore. And then you have our, uh, artificial intelligence classifiers on shore that say, yeah, I, I think this was a killer whale, for example. Well, how do you validate that? Well, these tags, remember, they do drift around eventually. A number of them will be recovered. That's already been established. And then the tag also has the full data set. You can see, hey, let me look at this vocalization that we had fingerprinted and see if that really was an orca. So that's the idea here. Um, uh, and under the, the current SBIR, we are essentially miniaturizing a recorder to the size of these little payload sections here. 
I want to go over it. Some of you might be incredulous that this could really work through a satellite. And really, this applies to other things too. You could apply it in or translate it to, for example, detecting speedboats, distinguishing them from, you know, cargo ships, from fishing vessels. And of course, that could do a lot of resource protection, as I mentioned earlier. And so what, how the fingerprinting works, it's really following an algorithm that was developed by uh, Julie Oswald. It's called the Rocker algorithm. Yeah, you can look that up. Um, it's the fingerprinting as you, you have it something like this. Here's your, your sound, here's frequency axis, here's time. You could say, okay, the starting frequency um, was 17 kilohertz and here the ending frequency was seven kilohertz and you have a certain duration, a certain signal amplitude gives you the proximity of it. Um, and various other parameters that are really quite small and fit into a small data packet. It's not necessarily um, a foolproof, I must say. Uh, oftentimes these vocalizations can be overlaid and you're listening to multiple ones of them. That's one of the main criticisms that then you would probably not get a very good result. So, you know, it, it's something that just has to be improved over time. Um, how can you um, uh, start uh, your own ocean dashboard project if you now had some ideas like, gosh, you know, I do have this problem here with uh, uh, my, my uh, focus of work. Is there something where an ocean-based smart sensor could help? And I just want to give you some reference data. The first one would be, well, what, what does it cost to have one of these things? And here we have our CTAG a lot. It's a, a very basic tag. Um, it can be used for fish migratory studies. I forgot to mention it's actually been developed for mortality studies. You can tell, you know, if you uh, post-release mortality if an animal dies, um, you can use it. It has been used for um, uh, shark and turtle monitoring and protection, slightly different version for the turtles there, but essentially the same price ocean current studies. So that's a simple sensor, just light temperature, basic underwater geolocation by light and temperature observations. And then once it's at the surface, you get Argos communication and positions. And the cost declines with a quantity, $900 if you buy one, $400 if you buy 10,000 of them. Um, gives you a basic idea. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum, this one doesn't exist yet. We call it the WD1, uh, and it will be an acoustic broadband monitoring and satellite reporting sensor that can dive to a depth and to rise up again. Uh, uh, the, what it senses is broadband acoustic, which is uh, digitized, and again, we're developing that under the current SBIR. Of course, a depth sensor, magnetic sensor, temperature, acceleration, light, and one of the applications would be that you have a number of these uh, um, floating around and uh, detecting whales or the migration of whales, or maybe in other areas, you, you could use it to, to detect pirates uh, in the high seas because you could say, well, we are seeing a speedboat here far from shore. That's a little bit suspicious. But several of these things pick up the speedboat signature. You can also localize exactly where it was. Or if you uh, remember the Malaysian airline um, uh, aircraft that just sort of uh, disappeared west of Australia in the Indian Ocean, they were dragging um, uh, a um, uh, towfish along to hope to detect the uh, uh, signal of the black box pinger. They could never do it. There were some hits, but it was just kind of uncertain. Well, each towfish and associated research shift was just one sampling point. Now imagine if you had, probably not something as sophisticated as this, it can be a bit more simple actually and smaller and survivable. Imagine if you had seeded the ocean there with hundreds of them, maybe a thousand of them, all of them just you know, dropped out of airplane, sinking to the seafloor profiling, listening for that signal of the airplane pinger, then coming up and reporting it, you would have localized it very fast if it was in the area and you could have maybe found the debris of the airplane, which they never managed to do. 
cost here more expensive, about five uh, times as much at, uh, as this basic sensor uh, at uh, quantity 1000, but it gives you an idea. Um, I, here I'm just running a hypothetical example. Could you use this capability to monitor for right whales again in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is their summer residence? And uh, if you did a 10 by 10 kilometer grid, I don't think you would you know, always detect all whales at any given time in the 10 by 10 grid. There'll be some times where the whale has to come closer, but be enough to where you would probably detect all whales, even with a slight delay. And uh, so that would be maybe a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid to detect the whale vocalization to cover the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence. You would need 1,550 of them. Uh, that cost would be about $3 million for that. Um, now, you can reuse them once you, if you get them again, you know, then you could reuse them the next year. And uh, they did in Canada run out of funds for their aerial surveys with manned aircraft. And so maybe sometimes these uh, small and plentiful sensors can be a more cost effective solution. So, if you want to go do something like that, what's uh, your first option is you can simply use existing SeaTac devices, as Tiffany said. You can buy them actually in any quantity sole source under the SBIR rules because they've already gone through uh, uh, at least two stages of competition. Really, our work has tends to have gone to many more of them. And just use them for a novel purpose, you know, like, like Bradley did with uh, monitoring sharks. Or as we see here with Kutan, who was uh, uh, looking at the dispersal of hawksbill sea turtle hatchlings. You know, when those hatchlings left the beach, he simply threw a dive uh, sea tag lot in the water with them and got these tracks. You can see one of them up to 14 months where the sea tag drifted. And then they compare that to the to where how the hawksbills uh, uh, disperse. And then they can tell, hey, are they the hawksbills just drifting with the current? Or are they actively swimming? And there's a paper from 2016 about that. You can read up about that. So that would be just using an existing product. Option number two, uh, you can teach SeaTac devices new tricks with new firmware. So no new hardware. Uh, and we recently, I had a discussion with Starker, and they were looking at, geez, how can we, you know, can we use a magnetometer to detect? to detect maybe passing boats and ships at choke points. I don't know exactly why they want to do it. You can have your own reasons to imagine that. And so we did a little test. Uh, this is near our company. Uh, so this wasn't even the ocean. I just dug uh, a uh, one of our SeaTac mod devices here into the ground. There's a little hole here. And then I monitor traffic going by like this car here. And what you can see here is the distinct deflections. This is magnetic field intensity. This is this sort of dipole that you see up and down and up again. And you see that here again. This is somebody going by slow. And these other ones, low spikes is somebody going by fast. So, OK, $400 sensor. And it could just sit on the seafloor. And when it gets a pattern that is of interest to you, it's like, hey, why is there so much boat activity in the middle of the night or whatever it is? It would just pop up to the surface and report via satellite. Option number two, three, build a new payload section or capability for your specific purpose. That is the approach we're taking in the current SBIR with the pinger detector for spawning detection. And we have a new uh, thing that we want to implement. We have uh, developed a prototype of a buoyancy engine that would allow one of these things to sink down. And the further deeper you are down, the from a greater and greater distance, you can detect surface activity, and then it could come up again and report. So that's another option. For all these options, as Tiffany said, you can procure it through the phase three program, and that makes it a lot faster. And um, that concludes my presentation. I'll leave this last slide here with some uh, summary of um, the Ocean Dashboard. Thank you so much, Marco. We do have a few questions, and I'm going to start off with the um, ones that came in a little earlier in the presentation. First question, do you think the system will eventually be available with a drift and drive option? 
Yeah, with the drift and drive option. So that would be um, uh, one of these um, things where it requires some additional hardware. So that was sort of option number three. I must say, I haven't envisioned that yet because that space is covered by um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the ocean gliders uh, that are out there right now. But that said, as I would say, give me a call. You know, I'd need to understand more about your particular application. And if there's maybe a chance for, you know, maybe you're looking for, not for uh, an ocean glider that costs $200,000, but one that costs $10,000. And if so, we can, you know, I can at least think about it and maybe come up with some concepts. Matter of fact, thinking about it right now, I already have a couple of ideas on that. Great, thank you. Our next question. Um, what happens to the signal from the tag if the tagged fish becomes ingested by a bigger fish? And what happens to the tag as well? Okay, so, yeah, and, and actually, let me first go back to the first question briefly. I think you said drift and drive. If you said drift and dive, then we have a specific idea with a buoyancy engine. Um, uh, it was drift and, and drive. Okay, okay, I got that correct. All right, so the second question is, what happens here if um, a fish ingests these tags? And uh, I will go back if I can find it. Uh, to an earlier slide here. Um, what happens is this, you can actually see these characteristic um, uh, cuts here. These are teeth of some fish and we had uh, one deployment where I could see that on average a tag on the surface got eaten once a week for this particular case as it drifted across the ocean. Um, so the tags are um, uh, solid and what happens tends to be they just get ingested and they come out, they get regurgitated. We've seen that several times and they continue operating. Do they all continue operating or do you have uh, an amount of loss in there? That we really do not know uh, because there's always with these small sensors, some percentage of them that you will drop in the ocean and you will never hear from them again. It depends a lot on what the risks are in the particular area, are you close to shore, then they tend to, to just kind of wash up on shore, maybe get you know washed under the sand and they can't communicate anymore, or is there heavy fishing activity, somebody takes it out of the water. On average, uh, um, there is a, a, a large study already a number of years ago by Michael Musso, and he found that about 80% of these tags will ultimately complete their mission and report. And then there's 20% that you may never hear from again. But again, it depends a lot on the risk factors in your particular uh, application there. Great, thank you. Our next question, are there any plans to incorporate small cameras into the system? Mm, not at this time but at the same time our SeaTag mod uh, has a, a camera a critter cam has already been developed uh, for the SeaTag mod where the SeaTag mod uh, that's the pop-up tag is the controller for the camera and it switched the camera on and off based on certain dive patterns and that was uh, developed for uh, evaluating um, uh, great white uh, sharks as they go to the shark cafe in the Pacific. That work was uh, done by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, I don't think they actually used it for this purpose though. Uh, but um, so it's been done, but we haven't commercially adopted that. Uh, it would depend on whether there seems to be um, a good market for it. And of course, there is our problems associated with you no know, cameras. The obvious one is the, the fouling of the lens um, while it's underwater. Okay, thank you. Our next question. Uh, can you give any additional details on the Hawksbill tr hatchling tracking? In water, hatchling monitoring is a huge data gap in the sea turtle research. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So here, um, what um, Houghton did was uh, he didn't actually put these um, uh, tags on the hatchlings um, themselves, but rather they were, you know, um, they were operating at the beaches there in Hawaii where they hatch, and it was during those times when the uh, turtles then made their run for the ocean and again i'm not uh, a turtle expert myself you know at that point they would just simply drop sea tag lot into the water at the same time see where the sea tag lot goes compared to where the turtle goes that said um, we have a different tag called the sea tag dash tt which is designed to be mounted on the carapace of um, uh, a turtle and uh, it's solar powered, which makes it very small and uh, it survives a long time. And they've been used um, uh, very successful by um, uh, researchers in uh, uh, the Mediterranean in particular. So you get a small tag that can survive a long time on a, a turtle, but you know, these are sort of more the juvenile turtles that might be uh, 10, 15 centimeters in length, not the, the, the hatchlings themselves. It's still too big for that. Thank you, Marco. Our next question. Do you think this could be useful and or adapted for tsunami onset? Wow, that is uh, an uh, excellent question. And I must say on that one, the, um, the question would be how you detect the onset of the tsunami. You know, what are exactly the, the, the properties of the uh, tsunami wave? I know it's a very, very long wavelength wave, but in deep ocean, very low amplitude. My so my answer on this one would be I, I can't tell because I don't know enough about tsunami waves. But what I can also say is that if there is a way to sense it, be that while at the surface or be that by attack doing um, a dive and maybe using its accelerometer, for example you know, to, to detect a disturbance of some sort, or if it was in the vicinity of where the disturbance happened, and maybe there's an acoustic signature associated with the tsunamis, um, then it can be done. So in, 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 in summary, I guess you would say, if there is a way to measure it, then that way to measure can be incorporated in the small sensor, and then it can you know, potentially give you uh, the results that are needed. So that's a, a very important question. And I'll, I'll look into that some more. I have to educate myself some more on uh, the particular effects of a tsunami wave and how that might be detected. Thank you, Marco. Our next question. Have you considered using USVs to help in your projects to gain more persistence and coverage, perhaps? Um, and so we have um, uh, not done anything with um, uh, USB, so it's un unmanned surface uh, vessels here. Uh, we have been approached, though, um, uh, by uh, uh, an organization actually related to liquid robotics. And the idea would be here that when you have a, uh, a wave glider, you know, it, um, it's, it's one sampling site. And so the idea would be that you could combine these drifting sensors with wave glider. So imagine you have a bunch of drifting sensors drifting on the ocean, and now uh, you have a few, a smaller number of wave gliders. They could, the wave gliders could come around and pick up these uh, sensors, put them somewhere else and drop them off again. So now maybe you can go from one sampling point per wave glider to sort of an array of sensors that is shepherded by one or more wave gliders. And therefore, these low drifting and diving sensors could work as a 
um, sampling size um, multiplier for wave gliders. Great, thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions that I'm seeing right now, and I'm gonna give everyone about 30 seconds to get their questions in. Um, if you do put a question in after we uh, have ended this, you can uh, send it to either library.seminars at noaa.gov or Marco, did you have your email address on a slide that we could show? Yes, absolutely. Let me uh, 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 go to, the, to that. That would be on the first slide here. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, let me go back to presentation mode. So it's marco.flag at desertstar.com. Um, so what I want to point out while you guys might be thinking about uh, some additional questions while we still have some time here is that I like the question that I've received here so far. And you've noticed where I go like, oh, gee, I don't know enough about uh, uh, tsunami waves or whatever to answer your question. But I think you guys in the audience, you're seeing the potential here that, like, hey, this could be used, this basic concept of a smart sensor, a uh, smart reporting sensor at sea could be used for a lot of stuff and it could be very uh, cost efficient. Maybe that's a surprising thought, but then again, maybe not. If you think about how many different ways we're using our smartphones nowadays. So it really is sort of the concept of the smartphone of the ocean, what you could do with these small and plentiful devices. And so as you are thinking about it, you know, about anything like that, I encourage you to just send me an email and I'll think about it. You know, um, uh, you know, over time, I'm sure I'll come up with more answers. And in, in many cases, you know, um what you're looking for may indeed be possible and i'll certainly let you know what our experience with this particular aspect uh, has been to the extent that we do have it so i do encourage you to use that just send me an email and uh, we can talk about your particular requirement okay thanks marco um while we were chatting a few more people came in and asked some questions so with the uh seven minutes left i'm gonna try and get through these how large would the dive float the diving float be okay so the diving float that's a good one um if you uh review the presentation it's the one that i called the wd1 and our design target, see, right now our uh, biggest device is the SeaTac mod, and it's like a, a big cigar, maybe, that's the size. Let's call it like that. Yeah, it's a one-inch diameter tube. Uh, it has got this float on top of it. And, you know, I think it's still the size that where you can drop it out of an airplane. Again, I said, I think I have to validate that here. Uh, that's, I, I hope to get to around to that before too long. Um, the diving sensor will be a bit bigger, and I'm going to say that it's going to be roughly the size of a regular can of soda, but with a hat sitting on top of it. Uh, that's your syntactic foam and integrated into the hat, or maybe a little bit different will be this buoyancy engine, which will be solar powered that will allow it to dive to depth, listen or send something else, and then report to the surface. So again, about um, uh, uh, 500 grams, about the size of a soda can with a head on top of it. Can you drop this thing out of the, an airplane and it will survive? My sense is you would have to have a little parachute on a paper parachute that dissolves or something like that. Great, thank you, Marco. Our next question. Um, are any weather services tapping into the data sets provided at large deployments? No, certainly not ours, as far as I'm uh, aware of. You know, there's always possible that something is going on that I'm not aware of, but I don't think if it exists at all, it's not, not a big thing at all. There are also, you know, like dedicated uh, diving sensors, in particular the Argo system that does the CTD things, but they're again, much larger and more expensive. So we're looking at uh, something smaller here. But what I also want to point out is 
the work that DARPA is doing, not related to, uh, in the uh, ocean of things, in this case, not related to their sensors, which I think they call team one, but rather team two, where they are building all the data processing infrastructure. Their sensors are based on iridium. We are using, uh, um, at this point, um, the Argos system because we can make a smaller implementation with it. But I talked to the project team and they said, yeah, we could implement that too. And so I would actually in, encourage um, and hope that the DARPA team too, that is the really the, the dashboard that you would see that that will go further, you know, maybe be combined with some of our sensors, for example, but that would be a, a smart way uh, to go about it. And then maybe, you know, whether services and such would harvest this as well. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question. Have you experimented with ocean biodegradable materials rather than uh, plastics? I've thought about them, but we haven't used them. But we've had a discussion about that. And you see, um, that is again the ocean of things with DARPA. They are doing that, you know, like uh, one of their, their um, uh, sensors is actually, I believe, a wooden housing even you know ocean drifter and the solar panels are mounted on these wooden planks so they've done that i've looked at that and my sense is that the survivability of this would be problematic and i know that the argument then is okay well now you're really polluting the ocean with all these little sensors but i think that's I think it makes more sense to concentrate on sensor reusability rather than biodegradability. So when you find these sensors on a beach, you know, they have a lot of value. There's a gold mine of data in the archival memory that could never be sent via satellite. And so I would, you know, advocate for a system where there's an identifier, you scan it on your phone, you drop it in a, in a mailbox, uh, it gets returned, it gets washed, data gets recovered, it gets reused, and the Finder gets a finder fee to, to encourage beachcombers and such um, to recover these devices. Thank you, Marco. Uh, next question. Are there any environmental projects that you know of being done in the New York Long Island area using these sensors? I am not aware of any in the uh, New York, New York, Long Island uh, area, uh, one that we are involved with, although it's for our sonar point devices, so it's, you know, analysis after it's been recorded, is related to tidal power generators in, in uh, uh, the Irish Sea in Wales. There's a company called Minesto that is building these underwater tethered flying tidal power generators that fly like a kite and therefore experience a higher um, um, apparent current than the, the actual current is and makes them very efficient. But there's a concern they could collide with dolphins in the area. And so we've provided a sound source localization system, a sonar point variant that can uh, detect exactly where the dolphins are relative to these flying turbines. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a final question uh, that's asking about any interaction with DHS, and I am not sure if they mean Department of Homeland Security or a different acronym, but if you have an idea, Marco? Well, Department of Homeland Security, I'm going to guess that it's that. And again, as to the particular agency, I would say no, but at the same time, I also want to point out that this type of applications, yes, has been uh, tested with, um, although oftentimes I don't know exactly what the outcome of it is. Um, uh, for example, placing underwater recorders in remote US island territories to observe for boat and ship traffic there is one thing that we have sold uh, some equipment for. Um, uh, but I, I, I just don't know uh, the details of it. There are other ones. We get those every once in a while where, you know, it helps us to know what the application is, but the customer won't tell us uh, what the application is. Um, so that's, 
I think it has uh, a lot of potential in the area, but I don't have much in the way of specific projects for that to reference. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, we've reached the one o'clock hour. We want to thank everyone for joining us for this rescheduled event. And um, from several comments, I do want to pass those along, along with uh, my own comments. Uh, please stay, stay safe, Marco, uh, from all of these fires in California, and we hope you are well. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. As a reminder, this is recorded, and you will be able to find this on the library's YouTube channel after the event. Thank you all so much, and have a great day.